Blair's Club on the wrong side of Gramercy Park. Actually, I don't know if it does at all. Um, <coughs> it's terrifying to be up here without notes, um, but I will, I will do my best. Um, I actually, just to correct one thing, I actually fought in, a, in, a, in the Rhodesian army, unfortunately, at 17. Um, and <coughs> I'm, I'm, what I want to talk to you about tonight is one of my favorite subjects myself. No, that's not true. Um, <laughs> I'm actually talk about my father, uh, who I have written about, or is it whom, um, quite extensively. Um, I grew up in what was then Rhodesia in an incredibly remote part of Africa. Thanks for the hushed silence. Um, <clears throat> on the Mozambique border of what was then Rhodesia. Um, and of course, when you grow up, it's all, all you know. But even I realized at age four or five that this really was the end of the, uh, end of the earth. The, the little place we were in was then called Malseta, the white uh, settlers. Uh, it, it had reminded them of the Orkney Islands, where there was a little town called Malseta. And it doesn't look anything like the rest of Africa. It doesn't look like the African stereotype. It's high and, 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 it's, and it's temperate. Uh, and you can grow you can grow citrus and that kind of thing. And my father was this very remote character that I really didn't know at all. And he strode around the bush in a safari suit um, with a great walrus moustache and a sort of a mantle of hair swept back. Um, and you couldn't really approach him like other people. You had to kind of negotiate an audience, usually through my mother, who was like one of those little pilot fish that sort of, you know, pick the teeth of larger, more dangerous fish. Um, and and you, you, you couldn't really ask him normal things. He was a sort of Victorian part of familias, as I say. Um, and <clears throat> so until I was about six or seven, um, I just was left to my own devices, um, running around the bush with, with no shoes on. And as my parents suddenly discovered when it came time for me to go to school, not speaking completely fluent English, because I spoke Shona, which was the language of the people who were looking after me. Um, and when I was about six, our next door neighbors got murdered in what was the beginning of, uh, the, Redi of the civil war in Rhodesia, the war to end white rule. And with very little ceremony, I was dumped in boarding school and was um, uh, about two or three years younger than the next, the next uh, child and hated it. Um, and I remember um, making out one of those little prison calendars and crossing off the days until there was an exiat weekend, which was six weeks, and thinking if I can just last until then, then you know, I, I can get taken out of this place. Um, and I started wetting my bed again, and I was sort of terrified of the whole place. And eventually six weeks happened, and I packed, surreptitiously packed my suitcase, and I remember my parents' old Austin Westminster crunching up the gravel drive of this awful Dickensian school and running and opening the door and throwing my case in and jumping in after it and saying, this is awful, it's a huge mistake, I hate it, take me home. And of course, it never occurred to me that once they knew how awful I thought it was, that they would actually leave me there. Mm -hmm. But my father said, it'll make a man of you, and my mother said, I'm sure it'll improve, and they sort of eventually pushed me out the other side of the car and back. And from then onwards, I decided that was how the world worked. That was, you couldn't really trust anybody. That was, that was sort of it. And I never really saw my father again in any kind of meaningful way. I, I was at boarding schools that were ever further and further away. And as I say, my father anyway was this rather austere, unapproachable um, character. At 17, when I, finished my, when I finished the sixth form, I was an army truck drove up and we were put into it and we were conscripted and into a shooting war. And I went from there to Cambridge suddenly and was you know, arrived at Brideshead, Cambridge, where even heterosexual students male students had long white muslin scarves and it was very uh, and I couldn't quite understand and at, and at Guy Fawkes when all the when all the rockets went off I pulled everybody down to take cover underneath the hay bale and it was just very odd for me and I discovered very quickly that I didn't have enough money and that I wouldn't survive there financially so I went to the local job center and asked them what, were the, what was the highest paying job for someone with no qualifications and it ended up taking a job as the um, how would you say, as a, as, a, uh, as a nurse's aide, the person basically who tackles um, uh, rowdy patients when they attack the nurses. <laughs> I remember asking the woman at the job center, would I be armed? And she said, no, you won't be armed. <laughs> and so, so anyway, and my other job was to, was to bring people to the, 
electric chair, as it were. It wasn't a real electric chair. It was for ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, which was which this hospital did a lot of. And I used to strap them in, and I, I, and and it's a very difficult thing to do. And you, I used to think of it as putting the girth on a on a on a, on a, on a horse with a saddle. You know, there's there's no you just have to feel the right strength the strength to do it because people go into such spasms that if you don't get it correctly, they can break their bones. Eventually, I came back to Zimbabwe. Um, and the war had finally finished, and I was a foreign correspondent for a while, and I wrote about a, a, ma a massacre that happened there in Matabeleland, and, and I got thrown out of the country. And off I went, and again, I didn't really intersect with my father much. And one day he had a heart attack, and I was, uh, I was actually in Zululand for National Geographic, and my mother phoned me and said, your father's dying, you need to come back. And I went back, and my mother is a doctor, and the first, the first memoir I ever wrote, the one that was referred to before, Makiwa, um, a, a memoir, a sort of coming of age memoir, my mother's this very big character in it. Um, but my father is oddly, is oddly remote and not very well drawn, not fully drawn. And as I sat at his bedside, um, everybody telling me that it was only a matter of time, and his heart was racing. And I remember seeing the kind of screen, it looked like little clarinet keys, and it was just racing out of control, and it was literally going to, he was going to die of a broken heart. I realized in, in my head I tried to write an imaginary obit for him, and I couldn't. There were just huge swathes of his life that I just didn't know about. I mean, I, I, I just didn't have any of the details, and I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And he actually recovered. And when we got home, I was sort of plying him, you know, asking him more about this, and he, again, was his normal irritable self, wouldn't talk about it, kept sort of just pushing me off. And at that point, we came, we had come back to America. And shortly after that, um, in 2000, when Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe um, took over all the farms and there was this enormous um, economic collapse, I went, back to, I went back to Zimbabwe and things were terrible. My parents by then lived in the capital, Harare, and they had a very sort of what you would recognize as an ordinary suburban existence by then. They had a rather a nice house on two acres with a swimming pool and a couple of people helping them, a housekeeper and a gardener and one thing and another. And then things started spiraling down. And I started writing about it and looking at it through the filter of my parents who were this um, you know, typically upper middle class family. Um, and uh, the, there was quite soon there was no water and there was no electricity, and and they started um, breeding fish in the swimming pool because there wasn't much food. Inflation, hyperinflation was so bad by then that it um, that the, the value of the Zimbabwe dollar it, it halved every 24 hours. And they used to say that at the Royal Harare Golf Course where there was inevitably a pub called the 19th Hole, what else, um, uh, that, you, that people would, would order and pay for their drinks before they teed off, because by the time they'd done 18 holes, the drinks would have doubled in price. Um, that's, how bad, that's how bad it had got. And my parents became sort of prisoners in this sort of hollowed out suburban uh, um, life where I would open the fridge and there'd be just tiny little bits there, but they were so proud that they refused to be helped. Um, and my father was getting more and more crotchety about it all. He wouldn't, he was very, very difficult shuttling back and forth between New York and, and, and an incredibly, uh, increasingly threadbare Harari to actually, um, to, to, to help. And then, <clears throat> Eventually, on one trip I went back, and my father, my mother greeted me, and they had two cars, and I noticed one of them was missing. My father was absolutely manic about keeping these cars from being stolen, because cars were always being stolen around. He had all these different special precautions. He would, you know, li literally sort of tie the car to the burglar bars, and he would, he had a, he had a special lock on the, on the steering wheel, and all sorts of different things that, to make sure his car wasn't stolen. And, and I came into the house, and he was sitting on his, on his arm, in, on his armchair against the anti anti five more anti macassar thank you thank you um, I like you um, and um, and uh, he'd been he, he was terribly bloody and whatever and he'd been hijacked just outside and the car had been taken um, so I tried and tried to get them to leave and they wouldn't even as things got worse and worse um, and then when I was leaving on that trip uh, he hammered up a um, a, a photograph of three people I'd never seen before. And I asked my mother who they were, and it, she said, well, they're your father's, they're your grandparents and, and aunt on your father's side. 
And I came back to I came back to this country not quite knowing what to make of it. And then 9-11 happened, and I was completely um, sidetracked by that. And my mother then told me that the three that, that my father had had been brought up in Poland, in fact, and that these these people had been killed in the Holocaust, and that his name wasn't really Godwin, my name wasn't really Godwin, and that his whole identity was was um, was invented, and that he wasn't who I thought he was. And so when I went, I phoned my father after 9-11, um, and, and we had conversations, and I said, he said, well, what do you want? What do you want from me? And I said, well, I want to know who you are. And so my father sent me this extraordinary document, which was a sort of long written on filing paper all stuck together with, with with tape which was a family tree and then all the family tree all the, they all came down and out of at the end 24 of them 16 or 18 of them he'd written with the date of death and an x and an h which stood for holocaust and he wouldn't send that in the same document he sort of encrypted it and sent that in another document and when i went and, and he then told me what had happened to him is that he'd been he'd grown up in warsaw uh, to a secular Jewish family. He'd been sent to England to learn English uh, for the summer. It was the summer of 1939. And on the, Andrew will correct me, 1st of September, I think Hitler invades Poland. My father never gets back. His parents never get out. He fights in the Free Polish Army in the Battle of the Bulge and in many other battles. Uh, and then after the war, stays in England, marries my mother, who, ha who has a sort of, whose family is posh and anti-Semitic, and they end up going to Africa, which is why he doesn't want to leave, because the whole place is a sanctuary. And in the end, when my father does die, and I just missed seeing him, I got on a flight and didn't quite get there, and he had introduced and reintroduced himself to me, and I had these extraordinary conversations with him when I was already a middle-aged man, um, and was really getting to know him for the first time. And he asked me to, to promise one thing, which was he asked me to promise that when he died that he would be cremated. And it was so difficult to organize a funeral logistically that I slightly lost sight of this. And then when I phoned up the crematorium, they said, oh no, no, we haven't had gas here for ages. Um, you'll, have to, you'll have to do something else. And then I got a phone call from the funeral, the undertakers, to say that the morgue, um, there was no electricity, there hadn't been for, for weeks, and they'd run out of diesel for the backup generator, and the bodies were all, um, they were all heating up and that I had to take, come and retrieve my father's body within the next day or they would put him in a pauper's mass grave. So I, I, the one thing he'd asked me was to get him cremated and I failed him on this. So I went to the head of the um, Zimbabwe Hindu society and said to him, please can I, can I cremate him myself on a funeral pyre? And Mr. Patel said, no, 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 you can't. We, we're not allowed to burn white people here. We've been told you can't, we get in trouble and whatever. And I begged and pleaded and whatever, and eventually he said, well, there is one way around it. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, we could convert him to Hinduism. <laughs> so I said, it, that's absolutely fine. So I thought it was rather appropriate that my father, born a Jew who'd lived a Christian life, would, would die a Hindu. And I thought he would basically have all his bases covered. So thank you. Thank you.